Hey friends, I hope you're doing well. I'm glad we get to spend a little time in worship together this morning or evening, whenever you find yourself watching this. I just want us to step into the words of these songs um, as we invite the Spirit to invade all the spaces of our life and our world. And so wherever you find yourself knowing that we've talked about this a lot, just connecting with everybody else, wherever they find themselves all around the city or wherever, but that we get to still speak to the same God, inviting the same spirit to work in our lives. And so um, as we sing these words, let's just remember the beauty of inviting the spirit to have his way to work and do the things he's doing as we agree with what he's doing. So would you worship with me as you sing these words over your spaces in your home? Tasted and seen 
Spirit of the living God. We want more of your presence. We want to become more aware of your presence. So I pray that now over each home, each space that is being filled with your presence, that that we would be more aware of you right now, right in the midst of our every day. Let us experience your goodness, the beauty of your glory, most holy God. We thank you for all that you're doing. We open our eyes to see more of it, to see more of you. Love your city church it's so good to be with you whenever it is that you're tuning into this it's just so good to be with you i've missed seeing your faces and i just wanted to say hello and let you know that you are being held that you are being thought of that you are in my thoughts and prayers so often and so it's just a joy to just jump on here this morning and be able to say hello i have just a couple announcements for you this morning First of all, next Sunday for our in-person gathering, we're gonna be at Grant Park in South Milwaukee. You can watch for all the details of where and when um, on our Facebook page and on our website and in our newsletter. So if you're looking for that information, check out those places. And we hope that you can join us at 10 a.m. next week at Grant Park. Um, And if you're not comfortable joining us there, please um, just look for another video very similar to this. Um, to be streaming at 10 a.m. next Sunday, and we'll join together this way if you're unable to make it or aren't comfortable joining us in that way. And then also, I have to just say thank you for your gifts and your support, your financial support of Brew City Church. And so if you call Brew City Church your home, here's the information for giving, Um, and we just are so appreciative of what you've done Uh, to continue to sustain the work that's going on through Bruce City Church during this crazy time that we find ourselves in. We say thank you. And we're just so um, overwhelmed by your generous support. And that is it for the way of announcements this morning. So just know that you are loved, you are held. It's so good to be with you this way. And now I'm going to hand it off to Randy, our lead pastor, as he just continues in his sermon series on a way forward as we continue to look at racism and racial issues within the church and how we are being called to bring healing to that. So good to see you, Bruce City family. Take care. Well, hello, Bruce City Scattered. So fun to see you. Good to be with you. I feel like we're together. That's why I'm saying good to be with you. I feel like I get to see you, but I don't. It's disappointing, but it's fun that we get to engage wherever you are, wherever you find yourself, in your living room, in your kitchen, in your bedroom, on your patio, uh, on the way to work, whatever it might be. Fun to be able to spend this time together talking about real things, seeking the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you, way to go for actually trying to keep up with where Bruce City Church is. Way to go with trying to keep up with where we are as a church and being part of the church, even though it's really hard to gather together, or even though maybe you're health compromised, or maybe even though you're just not able to gather together. Way to be here and way to listen. Way to, way to not just take a back seat and wait for things to cool down. We're talking about some heavy things, some weighty things, and I'm excited that you're journeying with us. These are important things to talk about. And for some of some of us, I know these are challenging things to talk about, race and the church. For some of us, these are, it feels like pressurized right now, and it's really hard to engage in these things. We haven't thought about them before. Or maybe we have had a different view. Maybe you don't agree with us. If any of that is you, I just want to tell you, Way to go for hanging in there and watching and trekking with us and processing with us, even if you don't fully agree. I respect that so much, and I want to tell you we love you. And there's so much room for you, and we want to make each other better through these conversations. We want to hear from you. But we're so glad you're here. We're so glad you're, you're sticking with family, even though we might not agree perfectly all the time. And if you do have any questions, concerns, issues, encouragements, comments, anything, please reach out to us. Reach out to me, elders at brewcitychurch.org or randy nye at brewcitychurch.org. We can get together. We can chat on the phone, whatever is best for you. I'm grateful for you. Man, I'm grateful for you. 
So this week, as we continue and find ourselves in our third week, third, third of four, in this utterly unique sermon series, I've never done anything like it, where I'm using a combination of someone else's notes and my own notes that I've tweaked and changed, and other pastors around the city, around the, re- around the Milwaukee area, are doing this same exa- exact sermon with their spin on it, their twist on it, this week as well. This is so fun to be collaborating. Just so you know what you're doing right now, listening to this sermon and partaking in, as Bruce City Church, partaking in this, you're collaborating with other churches around the city. You're processing with other churches around the city. That's a fun thing, especially for something as huge and weighty as race in the church. So this week we get to talk about systems. Systems. Systems are things that are all around us, that our world is kind of built on, and we don't even realize it or know. A a good system is one that functions on its own, that's been functioning for a long, long time, that just keeps going and going and going and going, and it keeps our way of life sustainable and sustained. It keeps our world working. Capitalism is a system. Our economy is a system. Law enforcement is a system. Justice system is a system. All these things are systems that are were created and built and are, just keep our world going. Now we're going to be talking about systems of injustice this morning. Systems of racism. That really, what's undeniable is that historically our nation was built on systems of injustice and racism. I say that undeniable because of history. Because we can read racist laws that kept black and brown people from being able to have the lives that white Americans enjoyed. These are just facts. The current reality is something that will work out together. Now, this idea of systems is something that's not new to God and it's not new to the Bible. We find, especially in the Old Testament, where we get this beautiful narrative and this messy narrative of God and his people in this ancient world, that world was built on systems as well. Let me give you a couple of examples of ancient systems that we find that we might not even recognize as we read through the scriptures. First one is this is an unjust, ungodly system. This is from the book of Daniel. If you're tracking along and you like to read in your Bible, this is Daniel 3, starting in verse 1. And in this period, the Israelite people find themselves enslaved in, well, basically in captivity to the Babylonians. The Babylonians came in and just ran roughshod over over Israel, destroyed Jerusalem, killed all sorts of people, all sorts of family members, and then brought the Israelite people who were left alive back to Babylon and in captivity. This is a dark time for the nation of Israel. This is a time where they're wondering, where is God? Has God abandoned and left us for once and for all? And within it, though, there's these faithful ones. But here's here's, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. That's an outrageous name. But in Daniel 3, starting in verse 1, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high, 6 cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. An idol. He then summoned the satraps, the prefects, the governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. These were the people of power. Governors, treasurers, these are, these are secretary of commerce, secretary of, of, of defense, secretary of, of finance. I mean, you name it, all the important people were there. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Nebuchadnezzar is building a system as we speak here in the, in the text in Daniel 3. He's saying, I like this idol. I think it's going to bring us uh, provision and, and wealth. And so we're dedicating this idol and I'm going to institute a law and I've got all the important people with me and I'm going to tell them what to do and they're going to enforce this. This is Daniel 3 starting in verse 4. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and people of every language. This is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, sheesh, 
You must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down in worship will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. We all know this story, but what's happening behind the scenes in this story is that an, a wicked king is setting up an unjust system. He's saying that at this time of day, whenever you hear this sound, you must get on your knees and worship this big old block of gold. And if you don't, you're going to be murdered by the, by the empire. You're going to be killed. You're going to be burned alive, as a matter of fact. I mean, this is a familiar story, but just get into the reality of it. If you don't bend the knee, if you don't tell your kids to bend the knee, if your parents don't bend the knee to this brick block of gold, they're going to be burned alive. This unjust system being built right before our eyes in the scriptures. Then we find in Daniel... Three in further on Daniel 3 and verse 15, it says this, Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? And these three... These three revolutionists, these three people who were committed to Yahweh, even though the, if it meant disobeying the empire, even if it meant cost, costing them their own lives in an awful way of death, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend yourselves, ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing for, furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Talk about dissent. Talk about protest. These three were so committed to the ways of the kingdom, the, ways, the way of Yahweh, that they said, we're pretty sure our God's going to deliver us because we are not going to bend the knee. But even if he doesn't, even if it means that we got to burn alive and die that way, we're not bending the knee. We're not following your decree. We're not following this systemic injustice. We're not going to do it. It's a system that was set up to further marginalize God's people. Are you with me in, in, in seeing that? You have these foreigners who you have completely overrun. You've brought them back to your land. They still have their own God. And so now Nebuchadnezzar says, here's a way to further disenfranchise them. Here's a way to further rip their identity, their national and their, their religious identity out from them. It's to threaten them to burn them alive if they don't worship this block of gold. It's unjust and it's a system that was put in place. Now here's an example of a system put in place by God for his people's sake. Talking about systems here. And biblically, what does systems look like? This is Deuteronomy starting verse 20, or in chapter 24. So turn to, turn to Deuteronomy 24 if you want to follow along in your own Bibles. This is in the NIV as always. Deuteronomy 24 starting in verse 10. When you make a loan of any kind to your neighbor, this is God speaking to the, Israel, the people of Israel. This is God establishing the nation of Israel. They came from a nation of slaves and now God is trying to bring order to the, to the nation of Israel. And he's trying to set up laws and systems that will help them thrive. And he says this, when you make a loan out of any kind to your neighbor, do not go into their house to get what is offered to you as a pledge. Stay outside and let the neighbor to whom you are making the, the loan bring the pledge out to you. If the neighbor is poor, do not go to sleep with their pledge in your possession. Return their cloak by sunset so that your neighbor may sleep in it. It's like a down payment kind of situation, but he's saying give that back to them so that they can actually be warm. Then they will thank you and it will be regarded as a righteous act in the sight of the Lord your God. Don't, don't take from people who have nothing. God's trying to take care of his people and institute laws so that his people take care of one another. Verse 14 in Deuteronomy 24, Do not take advantage of a hired worker who is poor or needy, 
Whether that worker is a fellow Israelite or a foreigner residing in one of your towns. See, God had to say that because he knew that, that Israelites are a pretty tribal people like most people are and most people groups are. And they would say, well, we'll take care of you because you're an Israelite, but you foreigners, no way, not going to do it. It's not our job. Go back home. But God says, pay them their wages, whether they are a fellow Israelite or a foreigner residing in one of your towns, a refugee. Pay them their, their wages each day before sunset because they are poor and they are counting on it. Otherwise, they may cry out to the Lord against you and you will be guilty of sin. Holy moly. Are you listen, like taking this scripture and putting it into our world currently? Are we listening? Parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their parents, each will die for their own sins. Do not deprive the foreigner and the fatherless of justice or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Remember, in other words, a down payment. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. This is why I command you to do this. When you are harvesting in your field and you, over, and you overlook a sheaf, when you leave some of that, that profit behind, food behind, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless and the widow so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat the olives from your trees, again, that's not only food, it's also provision and money for them. When you beat the olives from your trees, do not go over the branches a second time. Don't be efficient. Don't make the most money you can. Actually, leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. Again, don't make the most money you possibly can. Leave your money, leave your provision for those who don't have any. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. That is why I command you to do this. So we find, friends, that God actually instituted systems, laws, put laws in place for, so that his people would begin to innately care for the marginalized, the immigrants, the refugees, the poor, and the least of these among the Israelites. This is not, you know, I, I, <laughs> we would listen to this. And if this was today, we might say this is kind of a political agenda. We might say those people should take care of themselves. Those people should pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Those people are foreigners or refugees. They're not our concern. We've got enough problems on our hands. I've got enough mouths to feed. This is the scriptures, friends. God setting up laws and structures so that the marginalized would thrive and be provided for and protected. God wants us to set up laws and systems that help all people flourish, not just our people. God wants to, us to set up laws and systems that keep all in mind, not just our tribe and people. God wants to set, us to set up laws and systems that care for the least of these and the marginalized, not just the comfortable. As I say that, I hope you've got some fear and trembling in you about our reality. The Holy Bible, we see God making laws that protected and provided for the marginalized. So let's think about laws that our nation put in place and the consequences of them. Can we do that? Let's think about laws that we've put in place. Last week, if you were at Lincoln Park in person, which probably most of you weren't, Kirsten Shedd, a great friend and member of Bruce City Church for a long, long, long time, highlight, she's from the Lincoln Park area, and she talked about redlining historically and how Glendale was a, a, a suburb that redlined, which meant means that banks would literally have maps of an area. They had maps of Mo the Milwaukee area, and they would have s certain areas circled and redlined circled in red ink, and it, those areas that were circled in red ink, a person would be pretty much, it would be impossible to find a loan, to get a loan from a bank for them to lend to a person if you wanted to buy in that area. And those areas were always where majority black and brown people lived. So where minorities lived, where black people lived in Milwaukee, redlining meant that if you wanted to buy a house in that neighborhood, in that neighborhood where your family had lived for years and years, you couldn't buy it because banks wouldn't lend to you. It made it impossible to have home ownership in the black community. Home ownership means everything in our economy in many ways. Once 
redlining was outlawed, white Americans found an another way to continue racist and oppressive housing laws and systems. And that was called through, that was through covenants. White people, white Americans, white Milwaukee and said, okay, you're going to outlaw redlining. Well, we're going to create these covenants for our suburbs and our subdivisions that do not allow people of color. There were bylaws written into a suburbs su zoning that did not allow white, non-white people to live. And this was all over suburban Milwaukee. I'm going to read to you now from a report and in, in, in research from the UWM. It says, by the 1940s, 16 of 18 Milwaukee County suburbs were using racially restrictive covenants to exclude black families from residential areas. 16 of the 18. We have not locally located racially restricted covenants in subdivisions in Oak Creek or River Hills. But for example, subdivisions established in 1927 in Cudahy, Shorewood, West Milwaukee, Whitefish Bay, and Wauwatosa all excluded non-Caucasian people. In the 1930s, subdivisions were created in Bayside, Fox Point, Glendale, Greenfield, Hales Corners, St. Francis, South Milwaukee, and all categorically excluded blacks. In the 1940s, Brown Deer, Franklin, Greendale, Hales Corners, St. Francis, and West Dallas were still using covenants to exclude blacks from newly created subdivisions. As late as 1958, 10 years after the United States Supreme Court outlawed judicial enforcement of these covenants, race restrictions were recorded in the courthouse for a new subdivision in Greendale. Have I named your neighborhood yet? Many of the, of the racially restricted covenants in Milwaukee area subdivisions extended into the late 1960s and mid-1970s. Several are still in effect today, even though we don't even know it. For example, the restrictions placed on the George T. Hansen subdivision in South Milwaukee in 1937 are in effect until January 1, 2024. Wellhours Park Edition, number five in Wauwatosa, has restrictions with a stated life until January 1st, 1980. At least six subdivisions in Wauwatosa contain covenants with automatic extensions renewing them to the present time. So in Deuteronomy, we find God establishing laws and systems to provide for and protect the marginalized among his people. And in the United States of America... We find laws and systems built to oppress and isolate the, the, the wealthy from the, from the oppressed, the white people from black and brown people. In, De in the scriptures, we find God instituting laws to protect and provide for the marginalized. And in the United States of America, we see systems and laws put in place to further marginalize the marginalized, to further oppress the oppressed just so we're on the same page. Now, some of you might be thinking, okay, that's, I mean, in Wauwatosa, they're not actively saying you can't come into this neighborhood anymore, even though maybe those covenants have still kind of be, like been in place or whatever. But really, most all of those racist and unjust laws and systems have been replaced. They've been repealed. They're, they've been taken away. And mostly you'd be right. But friends, these systems and laws that were put in place, that were enacted and enforced for years, for decades, for centuries. Friends, while most of these laws aren't in effect anymore, there are years and decades and centuries of racist and oppressive laws and systems created dynamics that absolutely still affect our world and particularly affect the reality for the black community in profound ways. Let me just read some things for you here. Today, a disproportionate, a disproportionate number of people of color are homeless or lack housing security in part due to the legacy of redlining and racist covenants. Black people make up nearly half of the homeless population, despite making up only 13% of the population, according to a Department of Housing and Urban Development report presented to Congress this January. Black people make up about almost half, half of the of, of homeless or people who lack housing security, but yet they only make up 13% of the population in the United States of America. That pra this practice, redlining, prevented black families from amassing and maintaining wealth in the same way that white families could, resulting in the growth of the racial wealth gap and in housing insecurity, which persists today. The net worth of a typical white family is $171,000 per year. 
The net worth of a typical white family is $171,000 per year, and that's nearly 10 times greater than that of the average black family's income per year, which is $17,000. That's not just from some hippie liberal publication. This is according to the Federal Reserve's 2016 Survey of Consumer Finances. The Federal Reserve. Let me say that again. The typical net worth of a white family is $171,000. The typical net worth, I'm sorry, not yearly income. The typical net worth of a white family is $171,000, which is 10 times greater than that of a black family, which their typical net worth, the average black family in 2016 is $17,000. The effects of systemic racism and systemic injustice. Redlining was banned in 1968, but the area is deemed hazardous by the Federal Homeowners Loan Corporation from 1935 to 19, 1939 are still much more likely than other areas to be to be home to lower income minority residents, a 2018 study by the National Community Reinvestment Coalition found. Areas that were redlined also didn't have the tax base. It just makes sense, right? The property value stayed super, super low in these ghettos, in these places where, and by ghetto, I mean places where the marginalized are forced to live in because of redlining and racist covenants. And areas that were, were redlined didn't have the tax base to support robust public schools, he- robust health ca- healthcare systems, or good transportation systems, leading to issues of public safety and thus over-policing. The system was set up in a way to structurally drive a continuous outcome of disinvestment and therefore disproportionate outcomes. Friends, this is what happens when you don't do what God does for his people and instruct his people to to set up systems and laws that bring bring about care and provision for marginalized people. This is what happens when you when you set up systems and laws that are inherently racist and unjust and oppressive is that when you even take those laws away after they've been in place for decades and centuries, the effects are still profound. So how does how does God what does God think about this, do we think? Let me just read a little bit. This is I read this in the first week in the series, but it's so good that I have to read it again. This is Isaiah 10, starting in verse 1. Woe to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees, to deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of my people, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless. What will you do on the day of reckoning, people of God, when disaster comes from afar? To whom will you run for help? Where will you leave your riches? Nothing will remain to crin- to, but to cringe among the captives or fall among the slain. Yet for all this, God's anger is not turned away and his hand is still upraised. How does God think about this? We don't have to guess. We don't have to wonder. God says here, Woe to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees, and those who do nothing about it. Let's read one more. This is Isaiah 58. Shout it aloud, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people, my people, God saying, their rebellion, and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. See, but they would say, oh, we do all your commands. We fast, we pray, we observe all the festivals, we go to temple, we do go to synagogue. We're great. They ask me for just decisions, and they seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves, and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen only for a day for people to humble themselves? And he's saying that in a mockery. It is, only, is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes, making a religious show? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is this not the kind of fast I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and to un- untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and to break every yoke. 
It is, is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and the malicious talk, and you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild ancient ruins and will raise up the old foundations. They will be co- you will be called repairers of broken walls and restorers of streets with dwellings. See, friends, God's call in this to me is crystal clear. Our forefathers, our nation, and people in the church set up these racist and oppressive laws and systems and structures to keep black and brown people in ghettos, to keep them out isolated from, from, from the wealth, to, keep, to make systems in which all the money and all the power was going towards white America. Let's, if this isn't to, to shame us. This is just real. I just read the history. That's just a little slice, by the way. And see, God's word is telling us that we have an obligation. We have a biblical imperative to fight against the yoke of injustice and oppression. That when we see it, we name it, and we do something about it. Our job as the church is first of all to listen, then to investigate and find out what are the outcomes of these systemically racist laws that have been ingrained into our culture. And then we ask how we can help dismantle those unjust, oppressive realities that have been cemented through the decades and centuries of systemically racist and unjust laws. We as the church friends do not have the option of standing back and ignoring this reality. We don't have it. God says you don't have that option. I'm not going to listen to you if you do. We as the church do not have the option of standing back and doing nothing. Our forefathers in the church helped build this system of racism and injustice. And now it is on us, the church today, to pick up our sledgehammer and to pick up our pickaxes and destroy and dismantle this foundation of systemic racism and oppression and injustice. It's our job today to do that. Whether we are responsible for these laws or not, whether we made these laws or not, whether we we find ourselves making racist statements or not, it's our job in the church since our forefathers built these laws and made these laws, it's our job to tear them down. It's our job. It's our biblical imperative. If we don't, I believe we're ignoring the word of God and we're ignoring the heart of God. And God says, I might just start ignoring you. It's not my words. It's Isaiah 10, Isaiah 1, Isaiah 58, Amos 4, on and on question is, are we listening? Are we listening to God? And are we listening to our black and brown brothers and sisters? And see, I think our black and brown brothers and sisters would tell us this work of li- towards liberation and freedom is a work that takes time and patience. It's a work that takes persistence. It's a work that takes tenacity and fight. It's a long haul. It's not a sprint. It's not one sermon. It's not four sermons. It's not a small group. It's not a ministry. It's not a production. It's a long haul marathon kind of work. It's work that we start and maybe our children and their children complete, but we must pick up those pickaxes and sledgehammers to begin putting dents and ripples into these systems of injustice that were created and that maybe have been dismantled, but they the effects of them are still very much felt in our society, in our world. And God is telling us, you don't have the choice to turn a blind eye to it anymore. You don't have a choice to ignore it. I'm calling you to action. And see, friends, when we do that, when we set ourselves to this divine work of liberation and freedom, we find the Spirit of God already there. See, because the Spirit of God is always hovering over the chaos, wherever it is. The Spirit of God is always among the marginalized, working to bring about liberation and justice. 
and we're always being invited into that work. And then when we find ourselves getting our hands dirty, not worrying about maybe tarnishing our reputation among good religious people who might judge us, what we find, friends, is that maybe then our light will burst forth like the, like, like the dawn. Maybe then we will be seen and feel and live in this reality where we are a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Then we get to rebuild these ancient ruins that our nation has been built on. We get to, to t dismantle them and rebuild something beautiful. This sounds like kingdom work to me. It sounds like the gospel. Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? Holy Spirit, would you guide us? Spirit of God, speak truth. Would you humble me? Whatever opinion we bring into this, whatever side politically we find ourselves on, it is irrelevant. Speak to us now, Holy Spirit. Keep speaking to us as we move forward. Call us to where you are. Empower the church. Empower us, Bruce City Church. Empower these dear ones listening right now. So we say with the Apostle Paul, we do not lose heart. Though pressed in on every side, we will not stop. We will persist. And we will join you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in your work of liberation and freedom for all people. We join you in it. Thank you, God, for this honor. Thank you, God, for this privilege of being able to join you in this liberating work. What better thing to spend our lives on behalf of? What better way to spend ourselves? I say yes, Lord. Only you can answer for yourself, but me, I say yes to you, Jesus, in your liberating work. I say yes to you in your speaking the truth. I say yes to your movement, and I say yes to new creation that wants, that is just relentless. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Over
Well, friends, thanks for being with us this morning. It's been good to be together. And I just want to leave you with one verse, a very common verse. You've probably heard it a million times where it says, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And so as we press into the places that God has for us this week, um, places to have good conversation, places to confront systems that need to be changed, whatever it is that we're called to this week, may we do it with love. May we do it with faith, hope, and love, and the greatest being love. So let that be your motivation as we leave this time together. And now let me just pray a blessing over you. Bruce City Church, I bless you in the work that we are called to collectively, that you are called to individually. And I pray that you would press in, that you would have endurance, that you would find your strength coming from the Father, Son, and Spirit. And as you do, I pray that you would be led by love, that you would root yourself and ground yourself there so that what overflows is love to a world that desperately needs it and desperately needs change to come and can come in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It was great to be together. Please plan to be with us next week at Grant Park at 10 a.m. if you're able. Otherwise, look here for another video next week, and we will see you then. It's been great to be together. Have a blessed week.